From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and California Governor Gavin Newsom go head to head in a Fox News debate as the House of Representatives votes to expel New York's indicted Congressman George Santos. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnists Alicia Finley and Bill McGurn. Welcome and happy Friday to you both. Governors DeSantis and Newsom are perhaps the two most prominent proponents of red state governance and blue state governance. And on Thursday night, they tangled for 90 minutes in a debate hosted by Sean Hannity. Uh, Let's start off the top with a couple of clips for flavor. Here is Ron DeSantis going after California and its crime. They have chosen in California to put the interests of the criminals over public safety. Uh, They treat... Uh, They're easier on sex offenders. They're easier on all these crimes that are leading to a collapse in the quality of life. And if you just walk around San Francisco, uh, you will see. And I think it's interesting. Gavin Newsom was mayor of San Francisco. So he took the San Francisco model, turned that into a template for California's collapse. Now the left wants to take the California model and use that as a template for America's collapse. Uh, We cannot let that happen. And here is Gavin Newsom, a piece of his opening statement. You want to weaponize grievance. You are focusing on false separateness. You in particular, Ron, are on a banning binge, a cultural purge, intimidating and humiliating people you disagree with. You and President Trump are really trying to light democracy on fire. So, Sean, there are profound differences tonight, and I look forward to engaging them. But there's one thing in closing that we have in common is neither of us will be the nominee for our party in 2024. Alicia, what did you make of this debate between the two governors and and what you took away from it? Well, I think it was instructive on many levels. You got to see both their temperament and their ability to respond on their feet. Personally, I viewed the first half an hour as somewhat unwashable. They were always talking over each other. But, you know, once as the debate continued, you got to see the contrast in their record. And Sean Handy highlighted some of those on the screen on crime, as well as taxes, migration and such. I think in Newsom, it was almost not just that they were playing to different audiences. Newsom, I think, very much tried to play to a progressive base because I don't think even though the debate was on Fox News, I think it probably got a decent pickup among Democrats who are interested in viewing a potential successor to Biden. So I think Newsom was very much trying to drive uh, support with progressives and kind of cast himself as the heir apparent. Now, on the other hand, I think it almost seemed so much that they were playing to different audiences, but they were also playing with different sets of facts. What occurred to me is that Newsom tended to, in the words of, you know, chatbots and artificial intelligence, hallucinate. He kind of just made things up. You were kind of left scratching your head. Oh, where did he get that? For instance, he said at one point that more people have migrated from Florida during the last two years than Californians going to Florida. And I looked up on the IRS website that collects data on tax migration. I also looked on the census website that also has state to state migration. And while no, 20,000 people each year, about roughly more moved from Florida to California and vice versa. But apparently somebody followed up with Newsom's team after the debate and asked, like, well, where's this data coming from? And they were basing this on per capita numbers. And actually, it turns out that per capita numbers were actually very basically the same. But he came armed with some defenses where I think it was very glib and he was able to distort or manipulate some facts and statistics in a way that I think maybe uh, at least uh, helped defend himself among the Democrats who were watching that thought he came off well. But I think for a lot of other Republicans, I think he kind of reinforced their view and impression that he's kind of a a lightweight and glib. That point about the migration also stuck out to me. And Newsom did that more than once. He was also asked about violent crime rates. And they had the figures up on the screen. Here's the U.S. rate. The California rate is higher. The Florida rate is lower. And Newsom's response was, well, let me talk about the gun death rate. And it was almost as if he had beforehand found some statistics to cherry pick that he could respond with. 
Similarly, when he was asked about the high gas prices in California and the cost of living there, and he blamed price gouging by the oil companies, which to me was a bit of a laugh line. But he is, I think, a pretty slick candidate in being unflappable by those things and having some sort of response to them. Bill, one of the things I was thinking while watching is this is the extrovert versus the introvert. And Newsom is good on his feet. He clearly revels in this and in sticking it to somebody and trying to have a witty response to something. Going after Ron DeSantis for mispronouncing Kamala Harris's first name at one point is a good example. And then Ron DeSantis, the introvert, I think he seems most at home when he's governing, when he's looking at the COVID statistics or the hurricane response plans and trying to base policy on them. And that's, I think, one reason he struggled in these 2024 primary debates is that it's hard to do that kind of thing and dig into that kind of data when you have six other people up on the stage all trying to get a word in edgewise. So, Bill, I mean, do you think that Ron DeSantis has helped himself? Do you think this was a contribution to his 2024 campaign? Well, you've asked a couple of things. I think both men helped themselves. And give Gavin Newsom credit. He went on Fox, not exactly friendly territory, and answered Sean Hannity's questions. I noticed there was a couple of columns today saying how outrageous it was that Newsom had to face not only DeSantis, but the moderator, when Republican candidates have that all the time when they go into debate. At the beginning, you identified the violent crime. I was going to bring that up because it seemed that Gavin Newsom's defenses were very glib. They looked like he knew what he's talking about, but very weak. He was always trying to flip the script and say Florida's worse, and they didn't hold up to facts. What his strategy was to accuse Ron DeSantis of lying, saying that's factually untrue when it really was true. So I don't think it holds up. On DeSantis, it probably helped him a little because Republicans saw him standing up to a Democrat. And as you point out, you know, in the governing, the red state versus blue state is right up his alley. He gets to talk about his record and so forth. My theory of why he hasn't done well in the debates, in many debates, he's answered very well on those kind of questions that he dealt with last night, red state, blue state, his policies. He's been very strong in defending them. I think where he's faltered in the GOP debates is that when he's asked a question where he thinks the honest answer is going to royal Trump or Trump supporters, I think he tends to hedge his bets and try to have the best of both worlds and come up with some cockamamie answer that no one believes. It makes him look a little disingenuous. And I compare that to Nikki Haley. I personally think Ron DeSantis would, in practice, be a better president. But Nikki Haley dominated those debates because she answered forthrightly whether or not it was going to please Trump. And I think people found that refreshing. They want someone to give clear answers. You know, remember DeSantis was at one point asked whether Mike Pence did the right thing in certifying the election results on uh, January 6th and took him three times to be asked by the moderator before he said yes. So I think last night was a different kind of debate for him. It played to his strengths and he did well. Alicia, what do you think Gavin Newsom is after here? At one point, Ron DeSantis said, we're both running for president, except I'm the only one who will admit it. And is that what's going on here? Gavin Newsom has denied that he is running any kind of shadow campaign in 2024. There were a few points in this debate where he specifically made a point of defending President Biden and President Biden's record in a way that almost made him sound like a 2024 campaign surrogate. On the other hand, I can imagine some Democrats sitting at home who have been unimpressed with how Kamala Harris has handled herself in the vice president's office who might be thinking, ah, maybe we could do a Gavin Newsom switcheroo here. Maybe that would be a way to strengthen the ticket in advance of 2024. Well, I think there's no chance that they're going to do a switcheroo for reasons of identity politics. I think the reasons why she was chosen to begin with, there is no real belief that she was a strong 
candidate or would be actually a strong representative for Biden. She wasn't chosen for her policy chops. It was merely an identity politics play. And for that very reason, for political reasons, they cannot throw her under the bus. And I think that's a liability and a problem because she's not very popular among independent voters. She's not very popular among progressives. She's not very popular in California. Newsom is much more popular in California than Harris is. And though, interestingly enough, if you look at the polls, Biden, when they present the question among Democratic voters, who would you prefer be the party nominee, Biden, Newsom or Harris? Biden still wins in the landslide in California, which is interesting because we keep on hearing that, well, Democrats don't want Biden, but I'm not sure really Democrats want Newsom either. And definitely they don't want Harris, but the fallout of choosing Biden is that they're probably going to get stuck with Harris during the second term because nobody really foresees him finishing another four years. Now, on what does Newsom really want? I think he wants her and does plan to run for 2024. I think everyone is expecting Biden to stumble, whether it's a physical issue or mental or there's just some kind of family intervention or intervention of his advisors saying, hey, Mr. President, are you really up for this? Do you really think you can handle this? You know, maybe go off, you know, enjoy your retirement in Delaware. You still got an eight, nine or good years. Well, why do you really want to waste those, you know, dealing with Ukraine, Israel, those intransigent, you know, Republicans in Congress. So I think there's still an expectation that Biden won't end up running for president. And Newsom is kind of waiting in the wings. I think he'd have problems running in 2028. For one, because he will be out of office then. So that'll be two years after he leaves. But also, I think California's problems are going to get a lot worse. And and that includes its deficits, its economy. We're already seeing there's a legislative analyst office today just now actually came out reporting that the revenue figures so far just for this budget year, uh, which is like the first five months, are $26 billion below what Newsom was projecting in June and that they're anticipating up to $58 billion in deficits over the next two years. Now, if the country enters a recession, and right now, again, we're not in a recession, that doesn't mean just like that's a problem for Biden, but that's going to be an ongoing problem for Newsom in the next couple of years, too, when he's in office. And I don't think that that's going to help him when he runs for 2028, in addition to the, all the other problems and liabilities that California has on crime, homelessness, the migration that I don't think is going to stop or ease anytime soon. I think you're going to continue to see out migration. Maybe that might be mitigated a little bit more by foreign migration, which was actually kind of the trend before the pandemic was that you'd see a lot of people leaving a couple hundred thousand people a year leave California on net. But some of that was offset, by the way, with foreign migrants, and that kind of fell off during the pandemic. So maybe the population loss in California will decline. But a lot of the other problems aren't going to go away. They're going to get worse. Newsom is not going to be, I mean, his record is already a big liability, which is why he didn't talk too much about it, to be honest. Last night, he focused on cultural issues. He tried to get underneath DeSantis' skin a lot with that comment that, Let's face it, neither of us is going to be the nominee. I think he was trying to rankle DeSantis and get a rise out of him in in a number of points and also attack him for banning fracking or as well as being for lockdowns before being against them, being for vaccines before being against them. And so a lot of that was, again, distorting DeSantis's record, but it was clearly trying to get a rise out of DeSantis. You know, he's known as a little bit have a glass jaw and trying to make DeSantis appear more unlikable. He was definitely trying to get under DeSantis's skin in some of those places. On the other hand, Bill, there were points at which I was thinking to myself, this is the kind of debate that the public deserves to be having in 2024. Where are Americans moving? What are the tax rates? What are the crime rates? Which of these models of government seems to be working? Which of them are Americans interested in trying out on a national level? And what I worry about is we're not going to get any of that at all. Both parties seem ready to renominate candidates that the public at large seems to dislike. And there's no guarantee we'll even get debates. President Trump has skipped all of the Republican debates So far, the Republican Party has pledged not to participate in debates that are organized by the Presidential Debate Commission. President Biden just turned 81 years old, so he might be looking for a way to duck a head-to-head debate anyway. 
There's RFK Jr., who's polling near the 15 percent threshold to participate. And so there's a lot of doubt about whether we are even going to get this kind of public argument in 2024, Bill. And by the way, even if we did with the candidates that are leading right now, it might be just a fight about, well, you're too old and you've been indicted. Yeah, that's true. It could be. I had this exact same thought you did when I watched after the kind of talking over the first 20 minutes or so, it settled down. There were substantive differences in policy and approach. And I think they were evident in the debate. They came out different worldviews clashing, and that was good for the American people to see and make up their own minds about it. So I thought it was a real service to the U.S. I also had the thought, though, watching it and watching Gavin Newsom perform, and I think he bobbed and weaved as best he could. He was pretty unflappable, even though he told a lot of whoppers to get out of it. He didn't seem upset. He was kind of in command of himself. And I just thought, there's no way Joe Biden can perform like that against a Republican nominee, no matter whether it's Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, or Ron DeSantis. I just don't think he's up to it. And there's going to be a lot he's going to have to answer for, such as his misleading answers last time around with regard to his son and the money made from overseas. 